And a good parallel of what would happen to liquid water on the surface of Mars comes if you look at frozen carbon dioxide or dry ice here on Earth. I mean, that's the block of frozen uh, dry ice there. But if you heat it up, it doesn't turn into liquid at all. It mm. sublimates. It goes directly to vapour. You're loving your demos, aren't you? I love this. It's not a science club, this. Yeah, don't anyway, not science club. The, well, the, the interesting thing, though, is that that's how water would behave on Mars. See, because the pressure's lower, yeah. the combination of pressure and temperature that tells you how a substance will behave. Now, we tend to think of Earth as unique because we have liquid water on the surface. You might think it's a rare commodity, but if you include ice and vapour, water is actually incredibly abundant throughout the universe, which might not be so surprising because oxygen is the third most abundant abundant element and hydrogen of course the most abundant element in the universe let's give you an example let's welcome back Tim O'Brien the director here at Jodrell now Tim I want to start with a, a picture this is a picture that'll be familiar to virtually every amateur astronomer the Orion Nebula mm -hmm. beautiful sight in with the naked eye in the winter sky but you pointed one of the radio telescopes here at the Orion yeah. Nebula so we're actually pointing our, our second biggest telescope here it's called the Mark II right this minute yeah. At there it is. The Orion Nebula. Now, does um, that cable go all the way out to the field somewhere else? <laughs> this cable travels right the way across our site, right to the and top, the focus of that telescope. And what you're seeing here, right in the middle of this trace, this live oh, yeah. signal, is uh, radiation coming from water vapour molecules in clouds in the Orion Nebula. 1300 light years so, so what actually is this it says obviously it's radio waves yep seen by the radio telescope yep. what are we actually looking at it's a thing called a maser so it's a bit like a laser except the m stands for microwave it's in the microwave yeah. radio part of the spectrum so it's spinning water molecules in space that are radiated beaming these radio waves towards us which is why it's so bright this is a signal of spinning water molecules in space <laughs> you're live. seeing to cloud live. and you know, rain that is actually i find live, that's right? wonderful that's yeah. actually happening not at the moment yeah. right i'm just impressed right that there. you get to see that amount of water vapor through the water vapour well, that we're all struggling exactly. to see. Exactly, we've got to see through our own atmosphere how with all those rain clouds and we can see this. How much is there there? Um, there's probably about uh, 100 or so times the mass of the sun right. in the Orion Nebula. Which sounds like a lot, but I just want to show this, this Chandra X-ray Observatory image of a, of a quasar, APM0, whatever it's called. And, uh, this is, <laughs> I can't remember the reading it. This is an artist's impression of what that looks like. Tim, very, very briefly, yeah. what are we looking at here? So a quasar is a distant galaxy with a supermassive black hole at its heart, billions of times the mass of the sun. Yeah. And this particular one is, is the most distant detection of water we've ever made in the universe. Right. There's probably about 35 billion times the mass of the Earth in terms of the amount of water. So much isn't also means presuming the earliest detection of water that we, that we have. It's so far away that, that the light from this thing has taken 12 billion years to reach us. Yeah, which is fascinating because you, you think, you know, oxygen, it must be produced in a generation of stars. So at least one generation of stars have lived and died to produce the oxygen to build the water in there. And how many trillion? Oh, 35 billion times billion. the mass of the Earth, basically. OK, so water is everywhere in the universe. In fact, Earth isn't even the only place in the solar system where you can find liquid water. In fact, go further there might be more of water on the moons of other planets than there is here on our own planet Liz is standing by with Linda Spilker from Cassini the NASA mission which first discovered liquid water on Saturn's moons right now thanks very much Dara Linda thanks for joining us you've been involved yes. with the Cassini mission since 1988 that's right and it has sent us back some spectacular images of Saturn's moons can you talk me through Enceladus because there are features on the surface that point to liquid water is that right right these five bluish tiger stripes are cracks or fractures yeah. in the crust of Enceladus at the South Pole mm -hmm. and Cassini instruments have measured the temperature deep inside these cracks and we find that it's warm enough to have liquid water underneath the tiger stripes and this liquid water comes squirting out of jets from the tiger stripes freezes when it goes into space and forms this beautiful comet-like plume it's a stunning image and, and when it comes to titan saturn's most famous moon this is a very recent image from cassini yes, yes. it's a river system flowing into an ocean now this is liquid methane which in itself right. is really interesting yes. and scientists are even yes. talking about the possibility of methane based life forms right. but yes. is there also evidence of liquid water on titan there's evidence of liquid water on Titan, but not on its surface. Okay. It's too cold there. Uh, Titan is deformed as by Saturn's gravity as it orbits around, squeezed in and out. And this amount of deformation is great enough that we know it can't be frozen solid. Mm. There has to be a liquid water ocean underneath Titan's Very icy crust. Interesting. And you combine the evidence of liquid water with hydrocarbons. That is music to the ears of astrobiologists. It points to the possibility of life, doesn't it? Oh, it's a fascinating possibility. Excellent. Thank you so much, Linda. Coming up next from us at JPL, we'll be finding out about the future of Mars missions here at NASA. See you very soon.
Now, it's not just Titan. There's another candidate for liquid water in the solar system, and that's Jupiter's moon Europa. Now, this is a, a picture of Europa taken by Galileo, which was in orbit in the Jovian system for a long time, back in the 1990s. And what you're looking at there is a surface of water ice. We know that because of spectroscopy, so the way that the light interacts with the surface, with the ice. And you can also see there are a lot of cracks on the surface. And if we zoom in to another picture, again taken by Galileo, of those ridges on Europa, then what you're looking at there is ice sheets but moving against each other over the years Galileo saw those ridges shift we also have pictures from Voyager actually back in the 70s of those ridges that is very suggestive because it looks like it's the same way that water ice behaves on in the Antarctic or the Arctic so that also the way that Europa interacts with Jupiter's magnetic field when it orbits around us it tells us there's an ocean beneath that ice and the fascinating thing is that there is more water in the ocean of Europa than there is in all the oceans of the Earth combined. So there's liquid water within that, but it's a long way away from the Sun. So where is it getting its heat from? It is, and, and it's from its orbit. The orbit's very elliptical. It's kept elliptical, actually, by its interaction with the other moons of Jupiter, the Jovian satellites, the Galilean satellites. Because it's elliptical, it comes close to Jupiter, further away. The moon gets stretched and squashed. That heats the interior of the moon up by friction, just like if you did it on a squash ball. And that's what melts the ice and gives us this tremendous ocean beneath the surface. Now, if there are clear skies above where you are, then it'll be really, relatively easy to observe Europa and the other three largest moons of Jupiter after the show tonight. And brilliantly, if you do get out there and observe them, you'll be following in the footsteps of one of the greatest scientists of all time. In 1610, Galileo Galilei became the first person to observe the four largest moons of Jupiter. He tracked their movement with a new invention, the telescope, and found they were orbiting around the gas giant. At the time, the widely accepted view was that all celestial bodies orbited the Earth, that we were at the centre of the universe. But Galileo's discovery shattered this belief. They're known today as the Galilean moons, and they're really easy to observe. Anyone can get a glimpse of these distant worlds, and it won't break the bank. Even a simple pair of binoculars like these, or a small telescope, will reveal Jupiter's companions. Finding Jupiter is really easy at the moment, as it's one of the brightest objects in the night sky. Simply look due south around 7pm. The moons can't be seen with the naked eye, but look through a decent pair of binoculars, and they are suddenly revealed. They are even more impressive through a telescope. Each moon is a distinctive world, but even through a telescope, it's difficult to identify which is which. This is because they are so far away that they appear small and faint, even through an eyepiece. The four moons have different orbits, so working out which one you're observing can be tricky. And you may not see all of them all of the time, as one or two may be behind Jupiter when you're looking. Fortunately, there are free reference charts online and affordable apps to help you identify them. I'm lucky at the moment I can see all four Galilean moons, and I'm using an app to help me identify which is which. The moon I can see on the far left is Ganymede. It's the largest moon in the solar system, with a diameter greater than the planet Mercury. The tiny dot you can see to the immediate left of Jupiter is Io. It's the most volcanically active body in the solar system, covered in hundreds of sulphur-spewing volcanoes. To the right of Jupiter, the first moon I can see is Europa. This is the moon that scientists seeking life are most interested in. Images taken by the Galileo mission have shown us it's a frozen world encased in an icy crust that resembles the Arctic flows of Earth. And last but not least, we come to the outermost Galilean moon, Callisto. It's believed to have the oldest solid landscape in the solar system and bears the scars of four billion years of impacts. Thanks to their constant dance around Jupiter, observing the moons can be different every time. It's a spectacular sight, and learning about these diverse worlds makes seeing them with your own eyes even more incredible.
Now, it is possible to see all four of Jupiter's moons tonight, but unfortunately, I'm afraid it's still cloudy, so you can't see anything. But I've been joined by Brian May outside, and, uh, of course, Brian, the British weather, don't we just love it? And, of course, it's <laughs> rubbish for astronomy, isn't it, guys? Yeah. Now, yeah. what is it that makes <laughs> us keep coming back for more? I guess we just love it. There is a passion for knowing what's out there, isn't there? And I think it, it's once it's kindled in, in, in us, it, it never goes away. Um, yeah, we still do it. We still do it in England, although we get a very low percentage of, of nights where we can actually see something. But when you do, boy, it's amazing. It's really worth it, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we were lucky enough to capture some footage of the moons of Jupiter last night. We uh, were doing some rehearsals, and it was clear for us during the rehearsal. So you can see in this video footage the belt of Jupiter, and you can see the tiny speck of light just closest to the planet is the moon Europa. So we were very lucky to capture that last night. Now, of course, nice. Brian, the planets are really quite spectacular for most of us. Do you remember the first time that you saw a planet? Do you remember how you felt? Yeah, um, the first gasp was, was Saturn, and it, I, I still feel the same about it. The first time I saw it, I think I was a bit like Galileo. It was just like, my God, what is that? Because I, I wasn't educated. I was 10 years old and, and had a telescope, which me and my dad built, and it looked like two little circles next to each other. And I went, that's weird. What, why does it look like that? And then suddenly it dawned on me that you're looking at a planet with these wonderful rings around it. And it's just breathtaking. I mean, it is, isn't it? You never get over Saturn, do you? It's just amazing, the most beautiful object in the And it is quite amazing. Now, got a lot of keen amateur astronomers here. What's your top tip for all these guys here tonight? Well, I don't know about for you guys, but for people who are starting, you guys have, you know, know what you're doing, but for people who are starting, I would say keep it simple. Get something which is rigid and doesn't flap about, but is simple. Uh, my favourite telescope is, is a Dobsonian, which is just something which you point and shoot, basically. There's no, there's no gimmickry, there's, there's no electronics or whatever. Yeah, no, you just know, you have a find on it and you go, I want to look at that, you go, Psh, and you're looking at it. And that makes it so much easier, doesn't it? I would say keep it simple, yeah. No. And learn your way around the, the universe. Yeah, and what, that's what makes the... it so much more enjoyable, yeah. isn't it? But now, of course, sorry to go there. Um, if you want to find out if it's clear tonight, we're unlucky here in, in, in Macclesfield tonight, but if you want to find out if it's clear where you are tonight after the show, then here's Nina Ridge at the BBC Weather Centre. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you very much, Mark. Good evening to you. Yes, unfortunately, you are stuck underneath the cloud there, but there are some places where we'll begin to see some breaks in the cloud. A weather front's been moving south across the country, taking with the rain as well. So parts of the Midlands East Anglia in the southeast corner, unfortunately, staying with the overcast skies throughout the night. However, to the north of that system, that's where we'll see some breaks in the cloud. Certainly Northern Ireland, northeast England, eastern Scotland. Here we'll see some clear skies through the night. But but I think later on the risk of perhaps some patchy mist and fog forming. So these certainly look like being our best spots for tonight across the northern half of the country. Thankfully, the moon isn't going to rise until later on in the night for those areas around about six o'clock in the morning. So again, eastern Scotland, northeast England and northern Ireland, where you're most likely to see some breaks coming and going in that cloud through the night. Tomorrow night is looking a little bit cloudier, but Susan Powell will be here to give you those details. That's all from me. Now, last year we teamed up with the Zooniverse Citizen Science Project and asked for your help to find a new planet outside of our solar system. It was a huge success, with over 130,000 of you taking part, resulting in the discovery of a brand new exoplanet, Trepleton Holmes B, by you, the viewers. Well, this year we want your help again. So, whilst Curiosity Rover is exploring the geology of Mars, we want your help to take part in our own exploration of the planet's surface. Here to explain is Dr. Chris Lintot. So, Chris, what are we going to do this year? Well, Curiosity is doing a great job, but it's exploring one tiny piece of Mars, and that's like trying to understand Earth by sitting in Trafalgar Square for th a few years. What we want to do is send the viewers out to the rest of Mars. And so we've taken images from a spacecraft called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and we put them up on a website, planet4.org, oh, yeah. and um, these are images that no one in history has ever seen at this level of detail. They've been sitting on a hard drive, and no one's looked at them. So here we have sand dunes, uh, this is actually down in the Martian Antarctic, oh, so near sure. the South Pole. And what's the resolution here? What kind of uh, the, the small features, these things. small black things, are probably uh, maybe a hundred meters across, and the resolution you can see things that are this sort of size. It's quite remarkable. So if, if your dining room table was on Mars, we'd see it in these images. Yeah, and I think I can zoom in on one now, which is uh, let's. Yeah, we'll zoom in on these one. fans because these are mysterious. We see them appear every spring and then they disappear over the course of the summer. Yeah. And we don't quite know what causes them. We have our ideas, but these are one of the things that we want people to look for. So the site will teach you how to find these, and if you see them, you can mark them, 
and we'll try and understand and it. And you'll give people a patch of ground on Mars. Look, and what kind of, what kind of things will they, should they be looking out for? Well, these fans uh, are very excited. You see these spidery things as well. These are actually known as Martian spiders. This is what we think the fans are. If you imagine, imagine you were standing on a sand dune, you hear a rumbling underneath you, and suddenly this geezer erupts uh, 200 metres into the air. That's what produces these fans, we think. But we don't know and we hope to test But this, this. could be very important, couldn't it? Because you could say, it, this could be shown as that life is, well, Mars is not a dead world. That's right, this is something active that's happening on Mars. We think of Mars as a quiet place, but this is a dramatic and violent event. And it's telling us about the cycle that happens every year on Mars as it goes into spring. So now, we know that you'll be back on Thursday with some of the most interesting results. So we want people to do this, we want you to go to the website. There's a full tutorial on there to find your patch of Mars. Go to BBC co.uk forward slash stargazing and click on the box that says explore Mars. Oh, it might be Threppleton Home C. <laughs> explosion on the surface of Mars. Either. Anyway, searching for life on Mars isn't a new idea, of course. Ever since we were able to observe the red planet with telescopes, scientists have been theorising about what Martian life would look like. So here's a quick look at how our theories have changed over the years. The great astronomer William Herschel used his 20-foot telescope to produce some of the first detailed images of Mars. From observation after observation, Herschel faithfully recorded a surface with patches of light and dark areas. But then he went beyond simply observing. He speculated that those dark patches could be oceans. And if there were oceans, there could be life. In 1783, Herschel published his findings on Mars in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. He says, and that planet has a considerable but moderate atmosphere, so that its inhabitants probably enjoy a situation in many respects similar to ours. So already he's making the assumption that people live there. And that assumption that there are civilizations on Mars lived on for the best part of a hundred years. Then in 1919, they made contact. The inventor of the wireless, Guglielmo Marconi, was experimenting with his radio at sea and thought that Mars was signaling to him. In a way, I suppose this was the beginning of, of what we think of as modern radio astronomy. And it turned out that what he detected were not signals from Mars at all. What Marconi actually picked up were natural signals generated in the atmosphere. But the world's imagination was caught, and science fiction authors eagerly turned the inhabitants of Mars from humans into monsters. The Martian was born. And they were all bent on interstellar domination. This could be the beginning of the end for the human race. Hollywood filmmakers chose to show Martians hidden inside Cyclops-like machines. Even NASA was at it. On Mars, deadly ultraviolet radiation from the sun penetrates to the surface. Life forms on Mars may have silica shells to protect them against this radiation. It was hoped that the speculation would end once and for all when NASA sent probes to Mars. As the images were beamed back, some still thought life would be found. We've just had some amazing photographs sent back by the American probe to Mars, Mariner 6. You can see there some of the dark areas, which may be vegetation, and at the bottom you can see the white polar cap, which has always been thought to be due to some kind of icy or frosty deposit. Alas, as we soon discovered, it turned out to be a dead planet, full of craters. So was that the end of the Martian? Well, no, actually. For the last 40 years, the search for life has continued. But the Martian just got smaller. Instead of little green men, we're now looking for little green microbes.
Well, uh, joining us now is Dr. Lewis Dartnell from UCL, who is an astrobiologist. Yeah. To, to sum up, I suppose, what we've learned and the speculation, I want to ask you the question, first <laughs> of all. Speculate. What could we find on Mars? I think that the best... The best case, the best we can possibly hope for from Mars, considering all we've seen about its environment and how this horrible collapse in the conditions uh, kind of billions of years ago, is for primitive bacterial life, for the kind of extremophiles or extreme lovers that we find in, in harsh environments on Earth. Um, and I've got a bit of show and tell here. This is a rock, this is a sandstone from Antarctica, from the dry valleys. Um, so these very, very dry cold environment, the most Mars-like environment on Earth, and we use it to study our techniques of finding life. And if you actually turn over this rock and look on the inside, just beneath the surface you see this thin smear of, of green. This mm. is a, a community of life, of bacteria, that's colonised into the rock itself to protect themselves from the harsh, cold, dry environment outside so and living inside it. it we, we could imagine organisms like that existing on Mars. That's exactly what question. we're going to try and look for on Mars, yeah. We, and the big question, I suppose, is um, would it be the same, in, in, in a sense, the same biochemistry, similar, even all the way down to DNA, or would it be different? And if it were different, what would that suggest? We think the, the, the very fundamentals, so being water-based or carbon-based, they seem to be the best bets to look for. We, we'd, we'd be able to recognise that. But if we look at the kind of specifics of, of how those cells are built, what kind of organic molecules are put together to, to, to make them, Perhaps something like DNA would be a bit too specific. There might be alternatives to DNA that would also be able to store the information, the, the operating manual for a cell, um, and pass it on to but the next generation. All life on Earth is, is based on DNA. Oh, yeah, would it, it be is. more or less exciting for you to find that the life on Mars was DNA than it being something It'd completely be really, different? really curious. Let's say that, that the probes that we're sending to Mars are successful. We find Martians, we find life on the surface of the red planet, and we take it apart, we look under the bonnet of these cells and see how they work, and we find they're DNA-based and protein-based in the way that we are. That might mean that that's how life works. There's one way of making a living cell using those molecules. It might be that the reason Martian life is so similar to us is because it is us, and we are them, and we're the same thing, we come from the same, We've got a question same in origin. An, an email from Chris Cahoon who, who said, how do we know that we didn't come from Mars originally? So that's the million dollar question. If we find Martian life is very, very similar to us, it could be that life got started on Earth, because we have always been a wet, warm place, transferred over to Mars aboard a meteorite during this kind of spitting contest that the inner planets had during the early solar system. Mm. Or it could be that life got started on Mars first, because it didn't have a, a big moon-forming impact and got transferred over to Earth. So it might be we find Martians realising that, that we're here already. We are, we are the Martians. Wow. So what happens next in this search? What are the next steps for our exploration of Mars? Back to Liz at NASA Mission Control in Pasadena, California. Thanks very much, Dara. Well, to answer that question, I am back with Curiosity's twin. You saw her earlier in the Mars yard, but this is another indoor facility where they can carry out slightly more sensitive tests. It's such a privilege to see her again. And we are joined by Dr. Fook Lee, who is uh, the manager for all of the missions in a NASA's Mars program. Thank you so much for joining us. We know you're a very busy man, Thank Fook. You. You're welcome. Can I ask you first of all about um, the latest news that finally we're going to use the last tool in the rover's kit, the drill. Is that right? Yes, absolutely right. A drill is at the end there. Mm -hmm. And we're going to use it to drill into rocks, turn them into powder, yeah. and deliver the powder into the analytical instrument that are in the front part of the rover. And yes, the scientists have found rocks. They're really excited to test out this equipment. I can't wait to see what the data reveals. And when it comes to the future of Mars exploration, you have an orbiter mission coming up at the end of this year to investigate the thin atmosphere of Mars. You've also got another rover mission in 2020, but the one I'm really interested in is the one that speaks of returning samples back to Earth. Yeah, many of the scientists believe that some of the most important problems that we have would re involve returning a sample from Mars to Earth yeah. and use all the powerful instruments we have on Earth to analyze and address it. But of course, it's a much more ambitious thing because we have to take off from Mars and come back to Earth. Extremely challenging. But ultimately, do all these missions lead to one thing, and that is to put a man on Mars? Uh, this is my personal opinion. Okay. Uh, we all have an innate spirit to go out and explore yeah. the unknown. In the past, you know, we, we sailed the oceans, we climbed the mountains, we, go to the, we went to the South Pole and all that. And I believe that spirit is going to drive us also deeper into the solar system, beyond the Earth-Moon system. And one day, human footprint will be on Mars. When, Fook? 
I don't know. I hope one day soon. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Thank you so much for taking the time. We know you've got You're a lot welcome. on your plate right now. You're Thanks welcome. again. Well, that's it from us at JPL for today. Uh, but tomorrow, I'm going to find out more about NASA's Deep Space Network and all of its missions that are currently uh, being undertaken here at NASA. And also, I'm going to find out about the biggest space telescope ever built, which might finally answer questions about our very origins. So make sure you join me then. Back to you guys. See you soon. Thanks, Liz. See you tomorrow. Well, the next generation rover isn't from NASA. It's a joint European-Russian mission run by, the, by ESA, the European Space Agency. It's called ExoMars. It will be launched in 2018. And here it is. Here is the prototype of that rover. Well, with us is Abby Hutty from Astrium, who are responsible for the construction of this vehicle. Abby, uh, give us an overview of this. So this is Bridget. This is the very first prototype rover that we built to demonstrate our ability to build a Mars rover project. So it's different from Curiosity in that we're looking for life. We're not just looking for the conditions for life. Yeah. Can I say, I'm gonna get, we're about to start this, just in case anyone's about this, is, but this actually is fully functional. I've been given the incredibly complex control device. Bizarre. Uh, you've let it, so and also drive. these are the same, these are presumably the similar kind of rocks you're going to use during the fake Mars landing of 2018, are they? Uh, because they're very authentic looking. <laughs> etc. But what was it, so I know we were talking earlier, and you, you, I, you, I can say it, you can't. You said in some ways, in many ways, this is better than curiosity at some things. Well, one of our big developments is the autonomy system, so autonomous navigation. We can actually give our rover a destination. It doesn't have to be even in the field of view of yeah. the rover. And it can look where it is, map in 3D, it can form an elevation map, decide what's a danger to it, what's a safe place to go, and plan a route towards that goal, drive itself completely unaided by us here on Earth. And you said the key thing, there are two things. So there are life experiments, dedicated life search experiments. Which I think is a good point. I'm just going to bring in Lewis as well, the astrobiologist, I think, is very interested in this. And, yeah. and, and Brian May, who just, I think, wants to play with it as a toy. <laughs> and that's, uh, of course, right that's what I've been waiting for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got yeah. And then there's the Boring drill. Back with that one. So, 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 so the drill, we're going to get down two metres. Why would we want to do that? OK, so, yeah, we've got this drill on the front of our rover, and where oh, the cu no, curiosity... No, right. didn't didn't break it, didn't get, didn't where curiosity is only managing to take a sample just from the surface, five centimetre long tool, yeah. we've actually got a two-metre drill. We're going to drill subsurface, and two metres under the rock, it's going to be protected from the cosmic radiation environment. So if there is any life still on Mars, that's where we're likely to find it. And I must say, that one word, is there life still on Mars? Certainly. <laughs> Brian, this is my career is based on the show. I, I hold of the show, so, but I, I doubt it. We're going Thanks. to go to another show. We can discuss it at greater length. But first, we're going to go out and see how Mark is doing out in the field. Well, all the astronomers have gone indoors now for the start of Back to Earth. I'm here on BBC Two in just a few minutes. But if you, like them, have been inspired to look up at the sky and uh, learn about it, then there's loads of downloadable resources on our website. You can find out about stargazing live events up and down the country. Just go to bbc.co.uk forward slash stargazing. And if you want a more detailed guide for what to look out to for tonight, then you can stay tuned for my Starcast during Back to Earth, where you'll learn how to find some of the best objects visible tonight. Thank you very much, Mark. If you're after hints and tips on getting started in astronomy, then you should check out this year's Star Guide, put together by the BBC and Open University. It'll help you get the most out of the night sky wherever you are in the UK. Pick up one from a BBC stargazing event in your area, or if you want to order a copy, the details are on your screen right now. Are you enjoying that? Is that Absolutely. fun? You just want to put you just put stones in there and watch it, <laughs> which climb over them. Sorry. Try and stop me. I'm going to talk to you later in a minute. I know. But uh, look, keep your questions coming in, unless there are conspiracy theories saying that we didn't land on Mars. In that case, keep your opinions to yourself. Anything else, we'd love to go to the website, <laughs> Mars with Zoom Universe Project. We'll be back on in, in a second. Yes, we'll be on in a bit. See you later. <laughs>